and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on the show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This podcast is sponsored by Syncback Pro, the professional photographer's tool to keep your images safe. How safe are your photographs? Or to put it this way, how would you feel if you permanently lost some or even all of them? The fact is, there are very real risks in storing your digital images on a hard drive, even if they're backed up to an external device. There's ransomware, hardware failure, file corruption, virus infection, and even accidental deletion or destruction. Syncback Pro makes this problem go away permanently. Syncback Pro is the professional photographer's tool to back up photographs, images, documents, and data files. Once set up, it keeps your files safe, quietly and reliably in the background. So if problems occur or disaster strikes, you'll have nothing to worry about. Your photographs will be safe. Which is why it's also the backup solution that I use myself for my own photographs. Take advantage of an exclusive 25% discount today by going to www.backup.sg. The software will never expire, meaning your photographs are safe forever. That's www.backup.sg. Give your photographs the protection they deserve. And now, on with the show. Award-winning photographer and scientist, Franka M. Gabler, developed a fascination, admiration and respect for nature early in her lifetime. Soon after moving to California in 1997, she experienced her first wilderness backpacking trip in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Ever since that time, she's been photographing the magnificence of the high country mountains and the California landscape. Her photographs are evocative. The light and atmosphere evident in her photographs often result in sentimental impact and ethereal feeling. She strives to capture the mood and the essence of the places she photographs. Her images have been recognised internationally, including the 2022 Landscape Photography World Awards. Her photographs are published in several books and she has been featured in several photography magazines. Franca has spoken at several photography conferences. Her work has been featured in numerous exhibits and is represented in private collections throughout the US and abroad. We discuss the advantages of spending time at a location to gain familiarity, the enjoyment of her experiences in nature, and how her early experiences in the High Sierra have shaped her portfolio, along with a lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day, Franca. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? I'm doing good. Thank you good for having me. Let me know who you are and why you do what you do. Oh, how would I introduce myself? Um, I'm... <laughs> A scientist and a photographer. I usually put this little uh, mm-hmm. sentence in in my bio. Um, I moved to California from Croatia almost twenty six years ago. Wow. Okay. And uh, I moved from a city where I live in Croatia on Adriatic Sea, a beautiful city. I nice. moved. In the middle of the Sierra Nevada mountains, they're close to Yosemite National Park, and um, yeah, that was a lifestyle change for me. I can imagine. <laughs> and um, yeah, before moving here, uh, my life was all about the sea. We had the sailing boat, family sailing boat. They would cruise. Croatian Adriatic, which is fantastic, one of nice. the most beautiful coasts, uh, over a thousand islands. And um, it was, I think this is where I learned how to appreciate and love nature. Mm. I, I uh, The sea was my life at that time. Yep. And... Um, I didn't know mountains at the time, other than uh, I would go skiing once a year for a week in Slovenia or Italy. <laughs> and and uh, so then I moved to California, and uh, the reason I moved here was, um, well, uh, it, I, I met my 
not yet husband then, but I knew him from my childhood. His parents yeah. moved to Croatia, built a house next next to our house in the beach. And uh, then he came on vacation and it was a love story. And I decided I needed to come here and see what happens. Fair enough. And yep. That's how I ended up here. And so this why I ended up here. Uh, it was first ochre, it's not possible. So it's a small mountain town uh, close to Yosemite National Park. Okay. And um, yeah, it was a big, big change for me. Um, in the mountains, I, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't have appropriate clothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that that was yeah easily solved. But, yeah, you can't um, get around in ski gear all the time, yeah. can you? I, I moved here uh, basically as a um, as a visiting scientist. So yeah. I arranged a grant that I, I had funding, and um, and then I tested my relationship, and <laughs> I decided, you know, uh, I'll stay here. So this is yeah. my home. Yeah. So being a scientist, what branch of the sciences are you in? What are what are you uh, uh, exploring. Oh, uh, I um, I have background in art engineering, mm-hmm. and um, but it's all basically focused on um, plant diseases, pests. Okay. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, my degree, my PhD is in plant pathology, so dealing with plant diseases, and I always work with plants. With um, in in vineyards and citrus, so basically okay. grapes and citrus. Cool. cool. I still do that. I, I now I work with grapes only. Okay, nice. So, mm-hmm. why photography? What got you excited about photography, and in particular landscape photography? Where did that Where did that passion start for you? It probably has to do with my lifestyle change, you know, moving here in the middle of nowhere, um, not too much uh, active social life. <laughs> and and um, I, before that, photography and camera was just a tool for me mm. to like document my travels, family events. Um, I... I remember shortly before I moved to the United States, a friend of mine, um, he's a photographer in Croatia, and he asked me, what does photography mean to you? What is for you photography? And my answer was at the time, it was to capture a moment. Yep. Capture a moment. And, and I was basically thinking of documentary, I was thinking of uh, more street photography. I didn't think of landscape photography at all. Okay. And um, and then first, probably first several years, I was focused on my scientific job. I was, I was focusing on uh, doing experiments, publishing research papers and uh, it was basically re establishing myself as a scientist in the new country yeah and um, and photography just happened and it was a it was a weird thing how it happened because I never saw it coming okay a friend of mine from Italy visited and he was seriously into photography and so it, it happens always when someone comes from Europe, you know, oh, I want to show them around. I take them to Yosemite. I take them to the coast. Sure. And uh, But this is the first time that, you know, it was a guy with a camera and he was serious. <laughs> and so I took him to Yosemite once and then we went second time somewhere. And I was thinking at that time, why, uh, you know, how many more times he, there are so many places I wanted to show him. Why again to Yosemite? And it was winter time. It was 2006 and there was snow. And I remember the moment, um, 
I don't know if you know Yosemite, there is a one in meadow with the view of half dome. And yeah. um, so my friend was there focusing, composing. He was all in the zone. And I thought, you know, why is why it takes him so long to, you know, to take like the photo of half yeah. dome? <laughs> Don't you just push a button? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was totally um, like new to me watching someone so absorbed in what he was doing, and uh, and then he saw me like I wanted to move on. I, I I didn't say anything. I let him do his work, and then he says, "Well, can we ever shut digital?" And I said. But not really, you know. I I I still I had the Olympus film camera at the time. Yep. And uh, um, so he gave me his um, his second body, his old body, Nikon. Mm -hmm. I think it was Nikon one hundred. It was one of the sure. well, I think second generation digital DSLR. And uh, and I. I knew how to operate the buttons because I used Nikon at work yep. uh, to photograph my experiments. But uh, it was totally like, wow, you know, at the moment when I, I was able to see what I captured, how I captured, I didn't have to wait a week, you know, to shoot the roll of the film and then have it processed, coming back home and reviewing the images. Sometimes, you know, when you're shooting film, it would be like a month or so from when I made the image. Before you say yeah, it. And I, yeah. forgot, I forgot, you know, why I took it in the first place. <laughs> and so with the digital camera, it was like, wow, that instant opportunity for learning. Mm. That got me hooked to review the image. So we would, um, I just basically hijacked his camera. It was mine at that point. <laughs> Because he he had better one. He was he was using the uh, Nikon D two hundred. Sure, sure. Yeah, and uh, and then we would come home and we reviewed the images. And uh, I I did some um, I knew some Photoshop editing because I had a course that my work mm -hmm. uh, how to edit photos and make them um, you know recover shadows, basic stuff in Photoshop, some curves, yeah. levels, and and uh, and that was it. And I got hooked. And yeah. then I got my own Nikon DSLR. And uh, oh wow! And then I never stopped ever since. So so this is how many years? Like sixteen, seventeen years. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. So where did it start to become? art as opposed to just recording the scene that you saw before you it it started then okay that's, that 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 was the thing that changed my approach how i photograph and why i photograph yeah. before that before that i was just documenting you know travel okay or you know subjects this is half them this is el capitan and and that was it you know yeah, yeah. go any deeper into the subject yeah. and uh uh, and then, um, I, in the beginning, I was I was focused more on small details and small scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, where I live, there is a small creek, seasonal creek, and that I was exploring uh, rocks and running water. And I had a lot of things to learn at the time. You know, I at the time I didn't really know that if I use a long focal length. That I will not have such good depth of field. Yep. So there was a lot of learning, but it was easy because you know I would just go correct it, go back again, and retake the uh, same composition if something was wrong. Mm. And uh, then I learned how to uh, you know do the uh, combine the layers in Photoshop for maximum sharpness and. Uh, and then uh, I was photographing everything around the house. And I would go to Yosemite too, but I I didn't really photograph grand landscapes. Sure. I don't know why. But then um, I did a first uh, art show, which 
here in the foothills, um, it's an open studio tour. Okay. And uh, oh. usually there are hundreds of artists participating in different diverse media. And uh, so you open your house, you have this place outside, and people come and chat with you. I, at the time, I thought I was a photographer. <laughs> it was funny because I thought, I you know, I thought I was good at the time. Okay. And uh, uh, and people were mainly interested in uh, images from Yosemite, but they wanted the like normal images, like postcard images. Yeah, yeah. So the big like grand, grand landscape, you know, half dome, as you said, El Capitan. Yes, and uh, of course you can make this, you know, in like uh, boring light, or you can make them, you can make them in good light with interesting yep. weather. And then I started. I thought, okay, in order to be serious, I need to have my portfolio with Yosemite images because this is um, what will make me a, a serious photographer. Sure. So I went, like, for the next couple of years, I was going to Yosemite every time when it was interesting weather. I tried to make a portfolio of all the waterfalls and iconic rocks. And and I did that, but in the end, uh, I felt like I I didn't show anything personal in that work, something that, that speaks of me. And about me, it was just, you know, I was lucky to be there to capture all these beautiful landscapes in beautiful light just because I happened to live close and I was there often. And uh, um, so I um, I thought, okay, now I have this nice portfolio, and but why that doesn't feel me like I express myself? Uh, mm. doesn't feel like I express myself through my images. You're and, making uh, images to please other people rather than yourself, yeah? Yes. And and then um, I, but, and it's not that this, is, this was the only thing I was doing at the time, but this was kind of thing that I had in mind that I had to do. Hmm. And uh, once I realized that, that um, having such you know impressive portfolio of iconic landscape is nice but not so not particularly artistic uh, i i started uh, photographing more of um intimate landscapes yeah yeah and um and i remember the moment uh i think it was i think it was 2015 or 14 and um, I was, it was a beautiful winter day with atmospherics, a lot of clouds swirling around the iconic rocks, and everybody was photographing Yosemite Falls. And I looked, and I, I, I got my um, telephoto lens 80 to 400 millimeter, yeah. and I, I just turned my, uh, my head around, and I looked up into the mountains and I saw these beautiful atmospherics, you know, clouds swirling around the peaks and I, I, I started photograph that and I, I was in the zone. I was totally absorbed. And from that moment, I think this is how and when it changed my approach to photography and yeah. I I started um, looking for more intimate scenes and um, something to um, to to photograph that that shows piece of me yeah it. so so you mentioned that it was originally photography to you was capturing a moment. Is it still capturing a moment, or is it something different now? Uh, it is always a moment in time that you capture sure, when you photograph. Sure. But um, when I said capturing the moment, what it meant to me before was before I was thinking about like street photography or documentary, yep. and now I was thinking about landscapes. Hmm. And um, 
I, what I'm, for many years now, I'm trying to, um, I try to capture the mood of the landscape. Right. Yep. Instead of just like um, focusing on how I arrange the elements of the scene, I I want to add a little bit extra. So, mm. of course, you have to have good light, but I'm paying attention uh, for how I feel, how am I expressing what I'm feeling, or, um, you know, it, it's different. At different times, I, I approach it different ways for example sometimes i can just pay attention how the land how the light interacts with the landscape and sometimes i notice that um how i feel influences the way how i capture things and uh, influences what i photograph what i choose to photograph Mm. but um most important thing that I learned was just to try to not think but feel. Right. So when I when I'm in nature, I, I realize this is why I photograph. I like to be out in the nature. I like to experience the peacefulness, the calmness, the tempest, everything in yep. nature. Yeah. And um the moment, the, the way how can I do that is like I have to quickly purge my brain of all the thoughts that don't bring me into present moment. Yeah, right. So I kind of have to like uh, force myself. It, it's not forcing, but I just try to like um, focus on the moment. I try to. Close my eyes. I try to feel the place. I try to I try to hear the place. I, I try to smell the place, mm. and all these senses bring me into present moment. And then I, I kind of um, the subjects just call me to photograph them. Yeah. I know it's more things. So I'm not really um, I'm not going to photograph with a preconceived idea in mind i i just um open myself to be able to receive kind of be receptive to the environment and notice things yeah right so in terms of how you go about planning a shoot from the sounds of it you're not going in there with a preconceived notion of this is the shot that i'm looking for you more, I guess, as you said, feeling in the moment. When you when you're thinking about going on a, a, a photography trip somewhere, what are you what are you, what is it that you're looking for, and what is it that you are planning for? Oh, I, I will plan a little bit around weather. Yeah. So if, if there is interesting weather, I will try to be there at the location. You know, when it's not just like blue skies and sunny days mm. but um i i usually don't go for very long trips i will go for like um well two to four days and um i work four days so i always have three day weekends and with one just extra day with four days i can cover long distance yeah. which is not really long i mean that that's that's uh that's relative <laughs> long distance for me is death valley Yosemite is my backyard. I go there like sometimes after work. So yeah, yeah. it's um, long distance for someone else might be going to Iceland. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I'm basically covering um, uh, the um, places around California for yeah. several hours drive, like Yosemite, Sierra Nevada, Eastern Sierra. Uh, California coast. I, I go there a couple times a year, yeah, and yeah. sometimes I go to um, North Northern California and Redwood Forest and Death Valley. And occasionally, you know, I will make a longer trip. But this is a planned trip with friends. If I go to like, you know, ten days in Utah or something like yeah, that. Yeah, got it, got it. 
Do you look to challenge yourself and think outside of the box in terms of uh, new ideas and approaches to your photography? I, I, I don't like to force myself. Okay. Although I, I have to admit that I do, I did challenge myself uh consciously and i was very happy i did i um i tried to make myself use more of a wide angle lens mm -hmm. i i usually tend to shoot that uh with longer focal lengths yeah and um i did that a few times but very seldom i can go uh i usually stop at 24 if i have to go to 16 millimeter i am zooming in i it's too much yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. I guess one of the things that I'm interested in is how you've learnt that craft. Is it largely self-taught and experimentation on your own or have you used mentorship with somebody else or how, how have you actually learnt the craft of photography? Okay, so there's, uh, there are two things craft of using the camera which I learned in school and yeah. use it at work and then craft of art of photography. Yeah. And I I learned that on my own. I um I uh well my photography evolved obviously <laughs> from um uh, when I started uh until now I, I went through several phases but I basically, I was uh, experimenting until I realized and found out what I really like to do. Yeah. That, what I like to photograph, what landscapes attract me to photograph. Uh, and, and then when I realized that, everything was easy after that. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing, so my, I, I realized that you know, my some people have natural life for compositions. Some can learn that, and I think I was a natural in composing. And uh, but if, for example, from like six years ago, if someone asked me to explain my compositions, I wasn't sure I would do a good job. Mm, okay. And then I. Um, I started, I was invited to, um, to several photography conferences as a speaker and I had to prepare my, um, presentation and mm -hmm. I, and that actually taught me a lot. So all what I was doing intuitively before that, now I know exactly why I did it. Yeah. And, and, and that was, that was a huge, um, uh, leap in my photography education. It was mm. basically uh, understanding why I was doing something, why why I was, and why do I arrange objects in a certain way? Mm. Why do I choose different shutter speeds? So, so now I do it more consciously than before. Okay. There's still that intuition, yeah, but yeah. I understand the why, and I think that's that's a good thing. Yeah. In terms of the way that you look at the landscape, the environment is obviously, you know, a, an essential part of that. How do you balance the desire to create a unique and, you know, interesting image uh, with the need to stay true to that natural environment and the reality of the scene? Are you trying to I, – I think your style is quite – uh, naturalistic, but it can also be quite dreamy and atmospheric. And I guess I'm interested in how you get that, how you get that delicate balance between the two. Well, um, first, I, I, I love to photograph in misty, dreamy conditions. So, uh, yep. if, if these are the scenes with subtle colors, subtle light. And um, and then maybe I uh, in post processing you can do a lot. So mm -hmm. I would 
I tend to like um, when I process my images, I tend to reduce con contrast at first. Okay. And then just I will increase the contrast where I want the viewer to focus. What's important. Yeah. So it's basically um, uh, maybe slight tweaking in um, saturation, in mm -hmm. contrast, dodging and burning. Uh, but most of it is the result of that I do like to photograph in atmospheric conditions. This is yeah. like really my, um, I get super excited when, when I see fog. It's, it's peaceful and exciting at the same time. Mm, cool. Like, um, I don't know how, do you have experience with fog, photographing in fog in Australia? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, there, there are times when we, we do get it. And, uh, I mean, where I live, it's 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 not frequent. But, uh, you know, when, when I get the opportunity, I try and get out in it. <laughs> yeah, but because it changes the landscape. Yeah, it, it just makes, it develops the mystery around what, what's around you. And you can also isolate subjects and... Exactly, you know, yeah. And, and, change, and change so... Change the perspective, yeah. This is what I like to do. It it kind of the landscape looks new to me. Mm. It mm. reveals the new compositions reveal themselves all the time, depending you know if the fog moves and if it's thicker or not so thick. So um, I I like photographing in foggy conditions. I I it's peaceful and exciting yeah. at the same time. Yeah, cool. What does success look like for you in your photography? Oh. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I consider myself part-time professional. Okay. Because I, I, I do put up a lot of, I put a lot of energy into it and a lot of thought and a lot of time in it. Yeah. Yeah. I do it professional. But um so success is um well first I'm happy when when I experience that moment in nature mm. and uh when I uh have peace and sometimes when I come home and I don't even have I'm thinking, oh I didn't really make any award-winning image. I am happy and grateful for that time and couple hours I enjoyed making all these images. Yeah. So that's one. That that's satisfaction and um, you know happiness while in nature, uh, enjoying experiencing the the landscape, the weather, the uh, you know, observing, uh, feeling everything and, and working, you know, when you start, you know, probably you do the same thing. Um, mm. when, when you reach that stage of, um, creative flow, how nothing else matters. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and so that's a special mental state that I, that I like. Um, uh, then, uh, what else could be? Well, what is success? <laughs> I, it's also when I, when I make a really good image, I am proud of it. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, not, yeah, not every time that I go and photograph, I make really great image, but uh, when I make one, um, I, I consider that a success. Yeah. Fantastic. How do you balance your work life as a scientist with your photography life and your home life? Obviously, the those three oh, elements are yeah. always so, a challenge. So, something you, you gotta do. You get pulled <laughs> either way. <laughs> oh, I um, well, there is. So I, I work four days, so I have three days for photography, and this nice. is without 
taking any vacation days or and um considering that I don't travel too far, I can fit a lot in those three days. Uh, yeah. it's but um I if I if I go, you know, I usually take a, an extra day if I'm going on a longer trip or two. And uh so I do it in that way. Then um when it's when the weather is not conducive to the type of photography that I really enjoy doing, I will not force it. I will not um unless I know I'm just going for the hike. Mm-hmm. But then I'm just going for the hike. I will, uh, I will, I will take my camera with me just in case. But oh, okay. uh, I'm not going to uh, with 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 um, intention to make like great photographs. Yeah, yeah. So um, in those days, if I don't go, if I just stay at home, then I have time at home. Then I can, you know. Do stuff around the house and enjoy the family life. And usually, I'm editing my photos at the time. <laughs> so it, it, it's not really, but I'm present physically. <laughs> I'm physically present in, in my house, but yeah. um, it still gives me time to, to, you know, do a little bit around in the garden and uh, try some new recipes in cooking. I like cooking too. Nice, nice. And uh, the good thing for my work is usually, you know, I I don't carry my work to my home anymore. Right. Um, most of the time, I when I'm done uh, with working, I kind of um, I just move to photography and my second job. Yeah. <laughs> so, is photography an escape from that scientific method? Or do you apply some scientific method to your photography? Oh, <laughs> people people often ask me uh, questions how the two relate, and um, and I I always say you know they're both creative. They're yeah. both creative in a way how to um, how you're approaching a scientific problem versus how you're approaching your subject you are going to photograph. Yep. Uh, you. As a scientist, you try to uh, create some new solution for a problem. And mm-hmm. a photographer would be, you know, photograph it in a unique way. Like, I um, I try not to copy other people's work. Yep. But uh, considering the way, you know, how I'm... Mostly drawn to a smaller scene, it's it's hard to copy someone's work. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I I don't really um, I like to do things intuitively. I don't like to be consciously influenced by anybody's work. Yeah. So I, I like to do my own thing, and I find pleasure in doing that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, but um, so both photography and science to me um can express someone's creativity mm. and uh I have to adhere to scientific methods how i do if i when I'm doing experiment, it has to be done uh in certain ways uh I have to use certain techniques, and the same is the thing in photography you know I know how to operate the camera um I know if I change settings, what can I expect? Yeah. In my image, how my image will change. But I think the most important, uh, most important thing is basically both require critical and creative thinking. Hmm. Hmm. That's great. Mm-hmm. Do you ever have? Do you have a favorite spot that you like to repeatedly go back to? And what is it about that spot that draws you back all the time i do i do have several favorite spots and um it's well of course yosemite because it's yosemite valley is about an hour drive from where i live yeah uh, and really uh and i used to commute to work for an hour so to me that driving is nothing yeah 
uh, yeah, Yosemite is my backyard and my inspiration. I think I know every tree there, but <laughs> I still come come back again and um, you know try to photograph something different. Yeah, and, and yeah, photographing smaller scenes. There are so many smaller scenes that that you can find within a small area. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be large. I'll I'll, I'll give you an example after I, I finish this thought. So I I go to Yosemite because it's close. I go to Sierra, Eastern Sierra. I go, um, which is uh, just on the other side of the Sierra Nevada from where I live. Sure. I usually go there when Tioga Pass opens in the summer. Yep. So I make. So these are my favorite locations, like uh, Sierra Backcountry, um, Tioga Pass, Eastern Sierra, and and this is. I, I I went there. I'm going there so often that to me, I think I know them really well. Mm, mm. And um, yeah, I like Death Valley too, which is a totally different landscape. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been going there since 2004, every year, usually two times. So I I think I know the place. And it I like about it. It's it's so um, large and um, desolate. Although you see people and cars, but you can always, you know, move a little bit away from the road and you won't see anyone. Sure, sure. And yeah, uh, I basically go to the same places over and over. That's the thing. <laughs> Nice. Because of time time constraint, I, I would like to expand and go further, but right now it is what it is. Yeah, it is. you've got some fantastic places almost on the doorstep. So why would you go? For yeah, and then the coast is beautiful. You know, California coast is That's beautiful. It. Yeah, I go there usually twice a year. What's your most memorable experience? Photography experience. Yeah. Oh, I think it was. Well, probably because it was more recent experience. Last year, I went with a group of friends to um, High Sierra Lake, and wow. we were there for for a week. And it was a pack trip. That means um, that you know you have mules carry your stuff okay. out there, and then you just go with the day day pack. And then they drop off your stuff and leave and come and get you after a week. Right. And um, so it, it, there is something in uh, being at certain location for a long time. Mm. And, and, and you're basically out of touch. It's just your group and the la landscape around you. And it's amazing how the time passes by quickly. Yeah. You know, one would think, you know, what am I going to do up there in the mountains for a week? You know, there's, but it, it, it just, it's amazing how um, the time goes by quickly and everybody, you know, is surprised. Oh, we need to leave. We need to pack. It's, so last year, um, we just reached our destination. We had to cross the creek. So my boots were wet. Yep. I didn't, uh, yeah, my hiking sandals were in the pack where, um, hike, creek, creek crossing sandals were in the pack on the mules instead of with me. So I had to go, uh, into the creek knee deep. And, uh, just when we almost finished setting up our tent, our tents and our site, there was a torrential rain and storm with okay. um, lightning. And the creek that we crossed maybe an hour earlier or two was a huge river. We were basically cut off in that little yeah. area. And just to experience that force of nature, mm. it, it was, and, and you know, you can't, you don't have a house to hide. You know, tents will not offer you too much protection, but sure. it was, it was fantastic. I love that, um, that experience. Thanks for sharing that. Do you have any horror stories? 
Oh. <laughs> Oh, I, I don't really have horror stories, but I I do have a couple of um, bear and encounters and okay. a couple of um, it's not um, but it's a bobcat, large bobcat, once in Yosemite. Okay, but um, I remember when um, pandemic happened. Mm. In- they twenty they clay they closed Yosemite National Park and then when they opened it, oh, I was I was so desperate to go there because I miss it so much. It it was amazing how I felt when I when they opened the park and I could go back. So um I decided one afternoon I just want to go for a hike and my friends couldn't go. So I said, well, you know, it's not a long hike, just two miles. Um, I, I'll do it on my own and maybe I'll stay for sunset and I make sure, make sure that I had headlight in, in case I had to hike back in the dark. Yep. And then maybe one mile into the trail, I heard, uh, branches cracking. Uh huh. Knew there was a bear. Right. Because it was pandemic and reservations were required, there was no one else on the trail. It was just me. Yep. And the big bear. <laughs> and luckily, I didn't have a um, cell signal. And I, I kind of peeked around the um, corner and I saw the biggest, largest black bear. I, I think, I don't know how many pounds, but I've seen few bears, but this one was humongous. Mm. Mm. And I said, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? I, I kind of I said, shall I go back? Uh, what if he sees me? And I knew I had to make noise. Yeah. So he hears me. So, you know, it's, they're not aggressive like grizzlies. Yeah. But yeah. if they hear you, they will kind of walk in an opposite direction from you. So I called my husband and I, I said, yeah, talk to me, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Just need talking. I need bear to hear me, you know, so. And so we talked about 15 minutes. I said, well, I'll peek around the corner again and see if he left and he was gone. Nice. And I said, okay, I guess I can hang up. And then I had, I was thinking, what shall I do now? Shall I um, continue where I was going mm-hmm. or shall I go back? And I said, I'm going up. He very probably left. And then I remember I, I had um, my iPhone with me, with my playlist music playlist yep and i started to um to play loud my opera playlist <laughs> my <album. laughs> I said, and occasionally i would sing along and i said if this doesn't scare a bear <laughs> no. and uh yeah I, everything went well no. although yeah, one person was running the trail and he just uh, stop and you know, gave me a strange look, and I said, "Oh, and it's not like it seems. <laughs> I'm just singing for a bear." <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was. What's the practice of photography taught you about nature? It's a wide what? What is the practice of photography taught you about nature? Oh my, I, I, I may, may need to delete this one because I, I don't. To my that nature, I didn't understand it. So, what what has photography taught you about nature? What, oh. what have you learned about oh, okay. nature yeah. from photography? Okay, okay. Let's repeat this for the record. <laughs> because what, what, sure, what has the practice of photography taught you about nature? Oh, I think um, it taught me. Patience. Mm. It taught me that I need to take my time. It taught me to appreciate nature more. It taught me to learn about nature more. Sure. sure. So um, I, I think that I love nature more because of photography, because I can. I, I, I'm constantly observing. Yep. Even if I don't carry my camera, I will 
watch the light across the landscape. I will look for some compositions. And every time um, I, I react like that, it kind of it connects me to the nature more mm. than before. Sure. Fantastic. In terms of your processing, are you the type to race home as soon as you've finished the shoot, load up the images on the computer and get into editing, or do you take a more measured approach and take your time around it? Mm, I, 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 the moment I come to my house, I download my images. I still have my hiking shoes on. <laughs> and by the time I take my hiking shoes off, the images are being downloaded, and I have yep. to, I have to review them right away. And yeah, yeah. I usually, um, I will process a few, not that day, but the following day. So, sure. and sometimes if I'm happy, then I'll continue. But sometimes if I'm not happy, I will just like sit on them. Or maybe um, start from scratch. Yeah. Whatever I did, because I knew to think in a different way. I don't want all layers to guide how to correct them. I want to think fresh. Mm. So if if yeah, I'm not I, happy, if I'm happy, I just keep on. Yeah, it's amazing the number of images I, I come back with and go, ah, I should have stood about two feet to the left or two feet to the right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, or lifted see, the camera or dropped the camera, you know. <laughs> so th this is what I started um, doing more consciously now. Uh, when I mentioned that, um, when I had to prepare talks for photography conferences, so I started practicing that too. Yeah. And now, before I set up my tripod, and even if I do, I will always move a little bit to the left, right, zoom in, zoom out. Camera low, camera, and, and I'm more careful in watching if there is an intruding branch or if there is yeah. something, you know, messing with my composition yeah. than yeah. I did before. Because most time, times, you know, we are all exciting, excited when we see a beautiful scene in front of us. And um, sometimes I, I remember there were places that I ruined in my photographs. I mean, I photographed them and everything was perfect. The light was perfect. And there was a rock merging with the reflection of the peak in the water. Mm -hmm. And it was bugging me that um, it kind of, I ruined, I ruined the image <laughs> just because my camera position was too high. Yeah. 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 I've done that many a time. Yeah. Do you prefer f taking photos on your own or with other people? I I prefer photographing alone. Mm. Um, I I kind of um, then it, I like the feeling that it's just me and the nature, and we are conversing, communicating. There is uh, no distractions. I, I mean, when I go on longer trips, I will go with a friend, and um, then you know, I may think, "Oh, am I working too long? He, this scene, you know." Are they getting impatient? Yeah. On, <laughs> and and vice versa, you know, I'm, I want to move on, and my friend is still taking photos, and it's and then we talk and chat, so it's like a social time. Yeah. And while talk and chat then I'm not noticing the nature and landscape and compositions so I'm distracted basically. It can break you out of the zone very quickly. It, it does, yeah. yeah. It's 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 nice to have company but um I like to photograph alone. I, I know when I'm alone that I always um come back home with uh you know more meaningful images than sure. if I'm with sure. You obviously print a lot of your work. Uh, you've oh, yeah. got a got a few displayed behind you. Yeah. <laughs> do you print yourself, or do you use a, a service? And uh, I guess just some ideas around how you prep for for printing. It's all in house. Okay. <laughs> I I um I 
I've been printing my work since almost since the beginning. I think mm. I bought my printer in 2007. And uh, yeah, I think this is the third printer. It's 17 inches wide, so most images I don't print print larger. But if someone wants larger, then I will outsource it and send it to a printer. Sure, sure. Not. But I like um, I like to uh, yeah see if I need to adjust something right away. Um, if something didn't print the way I wanted it, mm. but I basically. I, I use uh, ICC profiles for paper printer combinations, and I usually get the the result that I kind of anticipated. Yeah, nice, nice. What sort of paper are you using? Oh, several ones. <laughs> I um, I, I have I I use um well matte matte paper and um, like a satin finish. Like yep. a slightly luster finish, like Epson exhibition fiber or Ilford Gold Gallery fiber silk. I like those two. Yeah. Uh, nice. for, for that luster satin finish. Depending, you know, each image, I think some work better on matte paper, some yep. will work better on luster paper. And yeah. so I, that's how I, um, but that's why I like to to see them both results at the same time. Once on matte, once on luster. But most of the time, I can tell which yeah. ones require that um, you know deeper contrast, which you can achieve with um, with the coated papers, luster papers. Then, yeah. um, yeah. hmm. how do you push past creative blocks and overcome challenges? And yeah, you know, what what sort of things are you doing to stay inspired and engaged? Uh, I I experienced a block uh, in the when the pandemic started in twenty twenty and mm -hmm. closed. I, I don't know how it was in Australia, but um, here we all the national parks were closed, um, state parks were closed. Basically, we were under lockdown and couldn't go anywhere. Yep. And uh, since I live in the rural area, lockdown is, I mean, I'm outside all the time anyway. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I couldn't, um, I, I wasn't inspired to do my usual landscape photography. It was springtime and everything was blooming, wildflowers and oaks were leafing and blooming. And I wasn't inspired at all. I, I, mm. I remember a few times I, um, you know, I went for a drive in my car and um, took my camera and tripod and I didn't take them out. I I just wasn't inspired and I thought yeah. for the moment I was, I was, I panicked. I had to be frank. I thought, oh my God, did I lose my, you know, my drive to create? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, what's happening? And uh, and then one day I, um, I of course I was in the house. Everybody was working from home, and uh, I had an orchid that I sacrificed its stem. I I froze it in a pool of water in my oh. and I I wanted to see how uh, you know. What will I get and how it will turn out? And I went online and looked for techniques and I figured out what I had to do. And oh my gosh, it turned out wonderful. And nice. so I went on. I got inspiration. So it was like a new project for me. New project, different type of photography. But it was so creative because I could uh, arrange my stuff in the tray, you know, when you're pouring water. I don't know. This 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 series is uh, on my website. Um, okay. This is um, called Ice Elation. And it's basically frozen flowers, flowers embedded, encased in ice. Nice. And then I started sharing this on social media and everybody got super excited. Uh, they started inviting me to come and visit 
their you know gardens uh, pick their flowers and mm. try this try that and um and and that brought my creativity back fantastic That's yeah awesome. i was surprised but it that the power of the project it worked yeah yeah no it's amazing how projects can do that i mean this this podcast itself is a uh a product of the pandemic and our lockdown right we we were down uh 165 days where we weren't allowed more than five kilometers away from our front door and around me it's suburban sort of nothingness as far as i'm concerned photographically (laughs) i mean there are people that do amazing stuff with suburban photography but it's just not it just doesn't make me <laughs> go and uh so yeah i uh, i was trying to work out okay so what do i do and uh i i kicked off a podcast so. <laughs> wow that, that's fantastic yeah. yeah it's a successful project for sure. yeah well so far i'm 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 certainly not uh not tired of it but uh and i don't think i'll run out of people to talk to either it's uh it, it's been good and been really good, I think, for my creativity. I've learned a lot through talking to people like yourself and uh, and others and trying to, uh, you know, I, I guess extend and learn as much as I can out, out of these conversations. It's a, it's a big part of, um, uh, I guess, what makes me or what I think makes me a, a, a better photographer is I, I can certainly see improvements since I started it. I can see that that yeah. uh, how that can you know um, spark different thinking and try different make you, make you try different things and new yeah. techniques. Yeah, definitely. Where do you see photography going in the future, and what sort of challenges do you see for photography uh, on the horizon? Hmm. Are you alluding to AI? <laughs> well, that, that's one of them. I mean, climate change is another big challenge. But I, I think there's a lot of them. <laughs> oh, I, I think there will always, well, it depends on what you mean by photography. To me, it's always part of the experience. Yeah. But I don't think it will affect me. I will still go out and you know, yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I'm, I'm not I, going to type keywords and try to, uh, you know, see what the computer and AI will create for me because I enjoy the time when I'm making the image at a location. I, I enjoy, you know, observing, creating, composing, adjusting camera settings, everything. But, um, yeah, I I don't think there'll be change for landscape photographs. Maybe photography contests will have, will have to definitely require you know to examine raw files. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I think not... I, I think uh, for people that are you know getting into that sort of thing, it's it's definitely going to be a. Uh, a bit of a challenge i think and i've said this on the podcast to a couple of people before uh i think commercial photography there's definitely some threats there but uh i think you're right for for landscape photographers the experience is for me 95 percent of the the, the yeah. reason i do it actually going and seeing amazing places and getting out into nature and uh experiencing it as you said earlier you know seeing it feeling it smelling it you know that that's that's what it's all about yeah but then in terms of what people will buy you know that's hard well to that's tell. it yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah i i can see that that you know if you are selling images and prints that someone can come with the fantastic ai generated print with you know beautiful light and yeah. majestic mountains and reflections and everything without even you know going outside the door mm. yeah 
I mean, if all you want is a pretty picture, that's that's great. But uh, if if you want the experience, and to me, I think the stories that, and I, you don't need to accompany a, an image with words necessary, but the stories that the images themselves tell about the atmosphere and what a, what you experienced when you were there, to me, that's you know a, a big part of what I do anyway is. I'm trying to share the feeling of what it was like to be yeah, exactly. there at that moment. Yeah. And, and you know, even now, without this all new AI thing, um, you know, AI was, people were already using it, like sky replacements. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Light yeah. adjustments and all that. It's like, yeah. It's, yeah, adding, adding color where you know you dull gray day. All right, well, I'll add some pink into the clouds, and it looks looks like a nice sun sunrise or sunset. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, but totally. Uh, yeah, like uh, faking the time of the day and uh, yeah, I, oh, I, putting I was, putting the aurora over at the Sydney Opera House, for example. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Time will tell. Yeah. What's your favorite thing about being a photographer? Everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, what's, what's your, I'll, I'll ask the question in a different way. What's your least favorite thing about being a photographer? <laughs> um, carrying stuff on my back and tripod. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't mind it, um, but... Um, I actually enjoy every aspect of it. I, 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 people say you shouldn't have expectations when you go, but I always anticipate something. I say, you know, I'm kind of, when I'm driving, I'm hoping to see this and that and this light. Sometimes it materializes, sometimes it doesn't, but if it doesn't, it's okay. I'll, uh, I'll photograph something else, mm. but I even, I enjoy that anticipation too. Yeah, you know, driving to the location, it's like where everything is possible. Then you come to the location and you see that your possibilities are limited somewhat. <laughs> but um, I, I always find something to photograph, especially when you photograph small scenes. You know, I don't need clouds in the sky, and most of the time, I don't include sky in in my compositions. Yeah. Unless it's like, I mean, I, I photograph ground landscapes too. Yep. When, when the timing is right, when the weather is right. But, um, and most of the time I, um, I will try to explore. So, so what I enjoy is exploring and experimenting. Yeah. And maybe, um, yeah, maybe, I'll, well, I, I, I recently, a couple of months ago, I tried a new technique and I loved it. I was using flash to photograph snowflakes okay. and snow falling. Yes. And I created the entire body of work with gigantic snowflakes. And I never thought I will use flash for my landscape photography. Yeah, I, I, I don't even put a flash on my camera. It doesn't have a built-in one and I... I <laughs> doesn't have built in. I, I actually yeah. had to carry that Nikon speed light on my. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. People looked at me in a weird way. <laughs> yeah. you know, I've, used, I've used my phone torch uh, to, uh, you know, light paint in a, a, a night scene or something, but uh, I've never, never used a flash. <laughs> yeah, that, that was uh, just to illuminate the, the flakes close to the mm. camera line so they are out of focus, big, gigantic, round, like bouquet, as bouquet and makes yeah, images yeah. look dreamy. No. And so that's, that's experimenting part of photography, and I tried that, and I liked it. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> what tips do you have for somebody that's just starting out in landscape photography? What, what would you tell you know, a, a young person that's uh, only just picked up a camera for the first time and wants to get into it. Oh, I would, um, I would advise that person to um, carefully choose um, the photographer 
whose work they admire and then mm. inspire them because there is there is uh, well because obviously someone's work will influence the way how you photograph for example you know some people like saturated images or like uh, very contrast images some like more subtle work yeah so it's okay to try everything and and see what what your vision is what you like to do yeah and and um and obviously uh important thing is to learn what makes a good image mm. is the important thing uh once you know what makes a good image which is subjective but yep then uh yeah, yeah then your photography will improve yeah fantastic thank you for that are there any photographers that you think I should be talking to on the podcast? Oh, uh, oh many. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, David, Th- David Thompson. Yep. Of course, Michael Fry and Charles. Bill Neal and Charlie Kramer. Okay. Yep. Dan Mitchell. I think you probably like to talk. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, I've got one more question for you. Sorry, yeah. go on. No, I just said Charlotte Gibb. Oh, okay. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got one more question for you, and uh, for many of my listeners, it's the most important one that uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of for uh, landscape photographers. Do you like pineapple on pizza? <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. <laughs> I, I know actually what original pizza is supposed to taste like. Yep. It's just tomato sauce and maybe cheese, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Everything else is extra, but pineapple, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for taking the time out, uh, Franka. It's been wonderful getting to know you a little bit better and understanding more about how and why you do what you do. Where can people find your work? Um, they can go to my website, francagabler.com, or find me on uh, Facebook and Instagram and Vero. Um, it's Franca Gabler, so if they type my name, they will find me. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Fantastic. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Vero and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.